glory today. God, you are God of creation, God of everything. Hallelujah. We lift you up today. Hallelujah. We give you praise today. Lord, we praise your name. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you. Hallelujah. And we just declare the light of God in this place. Hallelujah. Just shining, shining, shining. Jesus, you are glorious. You are wonderful. You are lifted up today. We praise you and thank you. Hallelujah. Let's give him praise. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Good morning, Cornerstone Church. Who's ready to worship God? Amen. Let's give him our best praise this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Amen. We're going to lift him up. We're going to give him praise, church. We're going to give him our best this morning. Amen. Prepare your hearts. Lift your voices. Let's sing unto the Lord. Stronger the 
that you would take my place that you bear my cross he laid down his life you laid down your life that I would be he said There is a power, there is 
Lord, in this place, Jesus, because you are here, God. Your presence is here, Jesus. You are with us, God. You go before us, Jesus. You've changed us, Jesus. You've made us new, God, to become just like you. Father, we thank you. Let's just give thanks to God today. Let's just give thanks. Come on. Thank you, Father. together who the sun and who the sun sets free oh is free indeed I'm a child of God yes I am who the sun come on we're free who the sun sets free oh is free Good job. 
Lord. Come on, just lift your hands this morning. Just love on Jesus today. Love on Jesus today. We just thank you, Jesus, for your goodness.
Hallelujah. Come on, give God a hand of praise. Lord, we give, give you praise. Lord, we celebrate your goodness today. Lord, you're worthy of all of our worship. All of our praise belongs to you. We magnify you, Lord. We give you praise and give you glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. As we're here today, we celebrate his goodness in our life. Amen. I just want you to raise up your hands right now as we just, I just want you to acknowledge him. I want you to just to be thankful to him. Just, just express your thanksgiving to the Lord for his goodness, his faithfulness. He's been faithful. He's been faithful in your life. He's been faithful in our lives. We just praise you today, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We magnify your name. Lord, we thank you today. We give you glory. There's none like you. We praise you today. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. We magnify your name, Lord. Praise your name, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We glorify your name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Holy Spirit, we just acknowledge and recognize your presence today. It just has filled this building. Thank you, Lord. You know every need, every heart. We thank you that you ministered them today by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty name, hallelujah. Everybody say amen. Come on, give God a shout of praise. Hallelujah. Give God a praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Just turn around and greet somebody. Welcome them today to the house of the Lord. Thank you for being here today. God bless you today. Say that name. Amen. Good morning. And uh, happy Thanksgiving weekend to you. Hope, trust you had uh, lots of turkey, lots of pumpkin pie, and uh, had a great time with your family. Uh, a few announcements here this morning. Uh, just want to hit on a couple of things. Uh, next Sunday is the Fuquay Christmas Parade. So we are always excited to be a part of that, an honor to be a part of that. Um, but we are, we'll have our ark out, our Noah's ark. Amen. Maybe, hopefully there won't be any floods. Amen. If you and your child want to ride, please see Pastor Tammy. Um, we also have adult costumes and need teens and adults to walk alongside the float as well. So that's always fun. Um, I don't know if we're going to do it this year. I've always wanted to get shark costumes. I don't know if we're doing that. We'll see. I don't know. So, uh, but we do have some other great costumes. We have a great time, and, and really everybody being on it and dressed in little animals and stuff make, really make it, you know, have a lot of fun. Everybody has a lot of fun. So that is next Sunday. See Pastor Tammy. December 11th is our guest worship leader, Roy Comtois, will be with us um, that day. So we're excited about that. Um, December 11th, 
um, and we will, uh, we're always excited. That's, that's Bryson's dad, so uh, we, he, we're, we're excited to have him. That's December 11th. Also, December 11th at 6 o'clock, ladies' Christmas party. Details will be in an email. Christmas is on Sunday this year, so we'll all celebrate Jesus together. Amen? What better way to celebrate Jesus than at church? Amen? That's always funny when Christians get up and say, you're having, you're having church on Christmas? Maybe you forgot about the reason for the season, amen? <laughs> when you, it was somebody's birthday, right? You normally go to their house, right? <laughs> Refuge also tonight. Youth giving is tonight. That's quite a word there. Tonight at 6 o'clock, bring a dessert and appetizer to share all the youth. Tonight at 6 o'clock here at the church. Um, and Miss Rita has a announcement, so I'm going to let her do that part. Thank you. If you're here, or if you have family who's not here, and amongst uh, the group of 60 and above, we have our annual Christmas party next Saturday. It is at 2 o'clock. I know it got announced as 1 o'clock last week, but it is actually at 2 o'clock from like 2 to 4. We have a lot of exciting things we do. We have lots of food. It's all free. You don't have to bring anything food-wise unless you have a dessert you'd really like to share because there's no such thing as too much dessert. And that's pretty much all I eat. And <laughs> but also we are we're doing in the past I've been asked to do this and I've kind of just done it on my own, but this time I'm incorporating, you know, some of my fellow seniors to help take place in this. I am putting together packages to take to a nursing facility and carry for family, for elderly that are there. My mother was a geriatric nurse her entire career, so I grew up seeing firsthand how many people spend time in nursing homes and hospitals alone. And families don't come, families don't exist sometimes, and that's just the way it is for some of these. And the nurses there often do their best, but having somebody else show that they care for them makes a big difference. So if you'd like to bring something small, I mean, they can't, there's not a lot, unfortunately, that they need, but lap blankets or some lotions or a book, uh, puzzle books, anything that you feel like your grandma would want, uh, please bring that and I'll be putting it together and maybe we'll do up some cards to take with. I'm going to deliver those the week before. I leave town on the 19th, so I'm going to deliver them before the week before Christmas. So even if you don't manage to bring it then and you want to bring something later, please feel free to do so. But I really look forward to having as many out. Every year we have more people and the more we have, it's just so much more fun. Pastor Lenore has some exciting worship planned for us, both fun and worshipful. So please come out and be with us next Saturday at 2 o'clock in the Learning Center. Amen. Um, at this time, we're going to receive the morning tithes and offerings today. Uh, we do have Brother Chelderai with us all the way from India, so we're excited about that. And uh, we will be taking up a special love offering at the end of the service to be a blessing to them and, and, and their ministry and all that God's doing. So, so excited about the treat you're, getting, you're in for today if you haven't heard him already. Um, but uh, with this time, we're just going to receive the tithes and uh, whatever you want to give in this first offering. Um, share with you a t uh, kind of a testimony I heard of sorts I was reading about and heard about was a, uh, was it, was a group in Belize that had about five, di the government government and people of Belize had about five different gov uh, major oil companies, Chevron, Exxon, some of those, come in and explore Belize for oil at one time. And they drilled, ended up, you know, these high-tech big companies, you can imagine their resources. They went around and in the end, these five companies collectively drilled right at about 50 different boreholes in the earth looking for oil and found zero, zero oil. And it was basically concluded by all the guys that no oil, there's no oil here. And then there was a small company in Belize that had enough money to drill two holes. They only had enough money to drill two. They don't find anything, they're out. But they began to take some of the principles of faith and to begin to see and believe there was oil, to envision themselves finding oil. They only had enough money for two holes. And here comes all the big wigs, all the, you know, the Exxon guys, these guys, you know, yeah, you imagine the equipment, the technology, and they can't find oil in 50 tries. These guys got two tries, and they just believed. There was no reason for them to believe it. 
they believed there was oil in Belize. And sure enough, but you can imagine I wouldn't be telling the story if they missed. It'd be a weird story. <laughs> but in two tries, they found the oil. And to this day, Belize is, from what I understand, uh, produced about 900 bo- barrels of oil a day in a country that was said by all the experts, there's no oil here. They didn't find the oil because of, of science, technology, or expertise. They found it because of vision and faith that it was there. They believed it was there. Amen. And when they believed it was there, they found it. And the same thing is true, though, when you look at the Bible, and they, we, for time's sake, I won't go into any, a bunch of scriptures, but, but I really believe sometimes we see, like, take, for instance, the miracle of Jesus when he, turned, when he fed the 5,000, or really about the 20,000, right? With, in, we include women and children and all that. Probably about 20,000 estimated. When he did that, I don't believe that was in, in one sense. In one sense, on the, on, in the, what we saw, we call that a creative miracle. But on another sense, I don't think it was creative at all. I think he just accessed resources that are there all the time. In that sense, I think they were always there. I think there was, there was inf- infinite fish and infinite bread available at any time. Amen. And he accessed that when he gave thanks for what he had. And I, and, I, and I just state that today about when it comes to prosperity, prosperity is affected more by what you're doing spiritually than what you're doing in the natural. Amen? Or at least can be, if you'll learn that. That when you tap into that flow, into that resource, that spiritual reservoir, amen, there's unlimited resource. And it's not in, I'm going to say something a little controversial here, but it's really not controversial when you read the New Testament. There's no such thing as God's timing. God's timing is now. That's my point. The resources are available now. The the amount, the infinite supply is now. The timing thing is purely about a natural carnal thing we all experience. Oh, when my flesh experienced it, that's when God did it. No, God did it a long time before that. God already had it ready before you asked. (laughs) You running into it is when you go, oh, this is in God's timing. That's just when you ran into it. It had always been there. You just ran into it, and, you, and in your flesh, you said, oh, this is the timing in which it happened. But it's now. The supply is now. God's not holding back, waiting for you to hit a certain number of check marks on a checklist before he goes, okay, now I'll do it. He's not up there at rest and then doing and then at rest waiting. He's already done. Amen? The, <laughs> the Bible says the works were finished from creation. He rested because it's all supplied, unlimited in his, it is an expression of his own nature in creation. It's all supplied. Hallelujah. And you waiting for it is an indication you've not tapped into it. (laughs) You looking for the timing is indication. That's not faith. Faith does not worry about time. Faith is now. Faith has it in here, in here, like a mom has a baby in here growing. It is now. The baby's now. There will come a time where everybody else can experience that baby, but the baby is now. Amen. And God's resources are available to you now. Hallelujah. You need to get your mind. We all have to get our mind out of the, what we see, what we're seeing and experiencing and get it on what God has said and who God is and what he's made available and put my mind on those things. The Bible says we put our mind on heavenly things where Christ sits. Well, Christ sits on a throne where everything's done. Amen? The throne that Christ sits on, everything's been completed. So my mind, the Bible says, Colossians, I'm supposed to put my mind there and think about everything as being completed in Christ, sitting on a throne, and me seated with with him in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. It's already done. So when I get outside of that mindset, though, I've stepped into what the Bible calls the flesh. When I get outside of that, I'm I'm in the flesh. I'm in the natural, I'm in the material world, and I'm just experiencing and looking at the world just from that perspective. But God and Christ have a different perspective. All supplied, all available. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen? Okay. Amen. So the fact is, is that maybe, let's say you're like police. You've drilled 50 times. You've looked and looked. You said it's not there, but you have to get past what you've experienced, what you've seen, what you've drilled and missed. You've got to just believe it's there. And it's amazing when you believe it's there, suddenly you can drill pretty efficiently and find it. Amen? Amen. So let's get ready to give today. Hallelujah. And I, one of my goals anytime that we get ready to give is that in your mind and in your faith, 
that you are aware of his abundance and aware of the availability of that abundance when you're giving. Amen? Amen. Stand on your feet. We get ready to give today. It's important that you do that. If you just give to give, that's great. But there's a, there's a power in being aware as you're giving, being aware of his resources, not yours. The devil wants to make you aware of what you're giving away, but at this moment is a good time to purposely put my mind on his resources, not mine. Glory. Hallelujah. So shift your mind if you haven't already, and let's pray. Father, we thank you today. God, we thank you, God, for those resources. God, we thank you, God, for your infinite supply. Lord, I thank you today, Lord God, that you've opened the eyes of our heart to the riches of the glory of what you've put already in us, God. And I thank you, Father, hallelujah, that people, Lord God, would just receive today with ease what you've already done for them. Hallelujah, that your people, Lord God, are experiencing all that you've done for them. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's give. Hallelujah. today and I just want to say on behalf of Sherry and myself we appreciate so much last Sunday the, the, the pastor's appreciation that was expressed to us we were certainly overwhelmingly blessed and we're so thankful for you thank you so much praise the Lord hallelujah uh, food was was great we had Jimmy under some pressure and he came through amen it was an excellent excellent meal we appreciate all of you that worked to help set up and break down and, and set back up it, it actually went really really well amen amen we're just so honored today and blessed to have with us pastor Chelderai from uh from chennai india he pastors a great church there and he'll tell you more about that he told me before before what he and i were visiting back there they're getting ready to build a six thousand seater wow so brother we're we're so thankful what God has done through your life and so I want to welcome you pastor come and and uh, share with us the Word of God pastor has been with us I think twice in the past and I can tell you right now what he preached both times so I'm really really excited to hear this word from the Lord from this great man of God thank you sir thank you for coming bless you amen so wonderful to be here with you again what a wonderful time of worship we had. What a great sense of God's presence. Doesn't matter what culture you come from, what language or which part of the world you come from, we worship the same God, the one true living God. Amen. So when we worship, we can really be one. All the differences are gone we find ourselves as children, as we sang, children of God. Amen. So wonderful to be here, really, and thank God for this wonderful church. I can see that you're all doing well, built a beautiful church, growing. I was uh, with Pastor the first time when he was just starting out in a very small way, in a school auditorium. He was meeting and it's so wonderful to see how over the years God has blessed you all and prospered you in everything that you have endeavored to do for God. Amen? Well, the pastor said I will share something about what's happening in our country, in our um, 
ministry and so on. Yeah, we will maybe talk about a little bit of that when we come to it. But I want to get to the word of God. This is Sunday morning. Sunday morning is preaching time. <laughs> Amen. Sunday morning is when we take the word of God and preach God's word. Nothing blesses God's people as God's word. So let me ask you to turn with me to Jeremiah 29. You know, I've been thinking about, you know, we have a great uh, service. You know, on Sunday mornings, we have four services in our church, starting from 6 o'clock in the morning. So today I was very relaxed. I got up at 6 o'clock, and we left from Winston-Salem and came here on time. But Sunday mornings, I get up at around 4 o'clock, and uh, I'm in church before 6 o'clock to preach at the 6 o'clock service. Then we have one at 8.30 another one at 11 o'clock in English, exclusively in English. The other ones are in local language. And then in the evening, we have one at 6 o'clock, which is a repeat of the same service, the morning service, to accommodate all the people that come. We have started a service in the evening, which is exactly the repeat of the morning service. So four services we have. And uh, so today is a very relaxing day for me. Just have to preach one service <laughs> and my son is preaching there all the four services uh, but on Christmas day and New Year's day we do something very special in our church we get a big uh, open air uh, space for rent and we put up a big 80,000 square feet uh, shed temporary shed and uh, we have just one gathering the entire church coming together instead of four services, just one service. And uh, usually more than 10,000 people gather in that service. We have a Christmas service on Christmas Day in the morning. And uh, on a New Year's Eve, we have a service, midnight service, starting at 10 o'clock. We finish at around 12.30 at night. We have a great midnight service. And I was thinking about what I'm going to be sharing on the New Year's Eve service. Christmas, my son will be preaching. New Year's Eve, I was going to be preaching, so I was thinking about what I should preach, and uh, God has been putting in my heart some thoughts about what I should share, and a little bit of that I'm going to share today with you. Practice session for me. <laughs> I can't wait till I get there on 31st to share that, but... Uh, let me share this. I think this will also be a blessing because this has very much to do with the context in which we live today, with the situation uh, that we see in the world today. So I think it will be very relevant for you as it would be for our people on the 31st when they hear it. And uh, it's a wonderful passage that has really blessed me. It's a promise of God. That somebody has said that the Bible has 6,000 promises. I have not gotten into counting them, I'm sure if I counted them, there will be certainly at least that many wonderful promises of God. I think the greatest promise is the promise that God gave to Moses saying, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And that promise, he passed it on to Joshua and then you see it in the New Testament, the author of the book of Hebrews, he tells the people to some thousand some years later, he tells the New Testament Christians, he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I mean, God's promises are timeless. You know, you can go thousands of years forward and still you can say, for he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Therefore, we shall say, God is my helper. I will not be afraid. What shall man do unto me? Amen. Amen. God's promises are like that. When God says something, you've got to respond to it. He has said, therefore you should say something. That's the way it goes. You know, a lot of people don't realize God's promises in their lives. They don't see it coming true in their lives, becoming a reality in their lives because God has said it, but they never opened their mouth and said anything. You know, <laughs> God said to the people of Israel, you know, I'm taking you to a large and a vast land filled with milk and honey, you know. 
but they never opened their mouth and said anything in fact they opened their mouth and spoke opposite you know the bible says 10 times they tempted the lord and i preached in my church 10 weeks about how they tempted the lord 10 times they opened their mouth and spoke the wrong thing every time never once did they open their mouth and say the lord has said he'll take me to a vast and a large land filled with milk and honey you know they never opened their mouth and said that that's why they didn't make it the promise of god even though it is so powerful and god is able to fulfill the promise they never realized it it never came true in them not because god was not able to bring it to pass but because they never appropriated it they never made it their own they never owned the promise of god they never said yes because you said i am now going to speak this is how the promises of god work you know so that is probably the greatest promise and i have preached very often uh, about that promise uh, in various places uh, uh, and i have appropriated myself in various situations i've gone back to that promise but i believe this promise that i'm going to share with you today is one such promise this is one of the greatest ones in the bible that's found in jeremiah chapter 29 verse 11 i'm sure some of you all will be very familiar with this wonderful words jeremiah 29 verse 11 let me read it to you from new king james version for i know the thoughts that i think toward you says the lord thoughts of peace and not evil to give you a future and a hope i know the thoughts the lord says that i think toward you says the lord thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope now i'm sure that you have one time or the other come across this promise at least read it put up somewhere or maybe read it in your bible and thought about it and these are wonderful comforting words you know of a hope and a future and 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 a peace and prosperity for the future and so on in general terms we think about these promises but i think all these promises must must be understood in its context when and how god gave this promise why god gave this promise what is behind this promise in what situation this promise is given that's what exactly we're going to do today when you understand this i think you'll get more out of this uh, than just simply looking at these beautiful words <coughs> these beautiful words will mean much more to you today i hope than it has ever meant to you look at the context of this when did god say this when did god say i know the thoughts that i think towards you thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and hope when did god say this promise see jeremiah chapter 29 is a very special chapter the context is this babylon was on the rise they were occupying various territories conquering many areas bringing them under their control and one of the places that they conquered and brought under their control at that time was judea jerusalem the city of jerusalem was brought under their control they completely demolished the walls of the city they literally desecrated the temple by taking away things that would belong to the temple in the service of god in the worship of god and they destroyed many houses the city was vandalized by the babylonians in those days this was a normal thing for them to do another normal thing that the people did was to take people captive and displace them take them to another place and relocate them kind of destabilize them by doing that you know take away their homes disown them from their own land and their homeland and so on take them far away to another country and put them somewhere so that they won't cause any problem you know they're here they'll be causing some uprising and so on take away and the babylonians were very very smart people you know they did not take away everybody they took away the smartest ones the best ones the skilled ones 
the gifted ones, the ones that were very educated, very able people, the young ones uh, that they can use for their own uh, uh, development in their, uh, in their kingdom. So they took them all there. They've just arrived in Babylon and they're camped outside the city of Babylon. And it's become like, becoming like a Jewish ghetto now. And you can imagine the feelings of the people. People felt terrible because who likes to be ruled by someone else? Who likes to be taken captive and taken away from their homeland? Who likes to lose their homes, their lands that God had given them, the promised land and, and the properties that belong? Nobody likes to lose what they have, especially their homes and their homeland. And nobody likes to be taken as a captive to another land and kept there. And this happened to them. And these people are filled with great bitterness. Things have not gone as they have imagined would go. Part of the problem was them. They were rebellious. They were a disobedient people. They would not listen to God. And, and they will not obey God. And for a long time, it has been prophesied and said that famine would come. And, and uh, uh, all kinds of things like this would, is going to happen to them. Because they're going to open themselves. They're not, you know, they're walking away from God, from the umbrella of God. I remember back when I was studying here in America, uh, there was an insurance company that used to have as their logo a man standing under an umbrella. What they're saying is, rain may be falling everywhere, but not on your head. <laughs> that's, that's a wonderful message, isn't it? <laughs> you won't be drenched because you've got an umbrella, you know. Uh, sun may be very hot, like in our country, you need an umbrella, even when it's not raining, because the sun is so hot, it'll scorch you. Sun may be very hot, but it won't touch you, because you got an umbrella, it'll protect you. Now, they were living under God's umbrella, God's protection, but they moved out of the umbrella. Now rain is going to fall on them. Now sunlight is going to hit them. They're going to be scorched. They're going to be... Uh, hit with famine and all kinds of things because they're moving out. Not because God is going to leave them or abandon them. It is because they are rebellious and they're moving out. God has already told them, warned them through prophets that this is going to happen. First 28 chapters are about that. Warning after warning was given to them. But now it has happened. What they've been warned of has happened and they're very bitter because of their failure. Very bitter because now they find themselves as captives in another land. They find themselves in a strange land. And Babylonians were the people that they hated most. And they're hoping that God will somehow send a man like Moses, a great deliverer, to somehow snatch them away from the Babylonians. Completely destroy the Babylonians and take them away. Take them back to freedom. Take them back to their homeland. Give them back all that they lost. Somehow redemption will happen. This is their hope. They were hoping eagerly. And there were some prophets that were prophesying. Oh, it's going to happen. It'll happen tomorrow. You watch. It'll happen in two days. It'll happen in two months. It'll happen in two years. They were prophesying. <laughs> and right at that time, because their hopes are high, some of these prophets are prophesying like some of the false prophets. You know, they like to prophesy what people like, you know. While they were all prophesying that kind of hope, false hope, a true prophet of God, Jeremiah, sitting in Jerusalem, wrote a letter and hands it over to one of the, one of the uh, representatives of the king who usually carries the tribute money to the king in Babylon. See, they were now living under Babylon. Jerusalem comes into Babylon, they have to pay their tribute. So they'll send messengers from here sending the money. So one of the messengers who regularly went to the king now was carrying a letter to be given to the people of Judea that were now camped outside the city of Babylon to be given to them. The prophet Jeremiah has written a letter. In that letter, before we get to verse 11, you need to look at, look at verse 4. Because in that letter, this is the content of the letter. Very interesting letter. Thus says the Lord of hosts. Now, Jeremiah has got a revelation from God. He's now declaring in prophetic terms. 
things that's going to happen. He says, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all who were carried away captive, whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and beget sons and daughters and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands so that they may bear sons and daughters that you may be increased there and not diminished. And seek the peace of the city where I have caused you to be carried away captive and pray to the Lord for it. For in its peace you will have peace. <laughs> now that sounds so good to us, but it didn't sound so good to the people. <laughs> Because they were hoping for this prophet to say, hey, just wait a minute. I'm sending a deliverer. He's going to come tomorrow and snatch you out of there and bring you back. And you're going to get your house back, your land back. You're going to come back to the land. Temple is going to be restored. Walls are going to be built. Everything is going to be done. Now, in the next few verses, if you read, this prophet is saying 70 years later that will happen. Not now. So you're going to be staying there for a considerable amount of time. 70 years is a long time. So more than a couple of generations, almost three generations are going to stay there. So they did not like this prophet. Why? Because look at what he's saying. He says, I have caused you to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. In other words, the one who's got them there is God. Certainly it was their rebellion that caused them to be in this condition, but God always never wastes any time. Even when we are disobedient to God and things go wrong in our lives because of our disobedience, even when bad things happen because we walked away from that umbrella, God doesn't waste that time. He's a great redeemer. He makes everything good, you know. Even that time is not lost. God has got a purpose. So God says, yeah, you've gone there because of your disobedience, because you didn't listen to me. I warned you, but you never listened. You've gone there, but I'm not going to waste my time. I'm going to get my will and pleasure done while you're there. I've got an agenda. God says, I have caused you to be carried away. In other words, there is the will of God for you being there. Since you are there by all these circumstances, your disobedience and so on, I'm not going to waste my time. I'm going to get my job done while you are there. And then God says, build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. Take wives and beget sons and daughters and take wives for your sons and give your daughters to husbands so that they may bear sons and daughters so that you may increase there and not be diminished. In other words, God wants them to grow. So he wants them to get married. So build houses, dwell in them, plant gardens, eat the fruit, and get your children married so that they'll have children. They'll not diminish. They'll increase in number. And fourthly, he says, seek the peace of the city where I've caused you to be carried away captive. Pray to the Lord for it. For in its peace, you will have peace. These four things seem to be the hardest things for them to do. They are in a mood of getting back to their promised land, going back to their homeland, going back to their homes that were taken away. They were ready to hear something about how God is going to give them back all that they lost. But what they're hearing is, settle down here. Now, I'll tell you, I'm going to preach it to my people there. <laughs> because, I don't know about here, I'm sure Christians are pretty much the same because people are pretty much the same everywhere. <laughs> no matter where we live in, which culture we live in. And the Christian culture also sometimes, you know, when we go wrong, we completely go wrong, everybody, you know. Because one leads the other like the blind leading the blind, you know. So when people go wrong here, we also go wrong because we follow many things here. <laughs> A lot of Christian people are so heavenly minded, they are no earthly good. Have you heard that saying? 
good old man used to say that. <laughs> so heavenly minded, no earthly good. I'd never forget that. And it's so true. I'm sure of our culture, our Christians, and I'm sure it is true in many ways of Christians here also. We're so, I'm not against being heavenly minded. We must be heavenly minded. But we get so far out being heavenly minded that we become no earthly good. We become so spiritual, so, uh, you know, set on those things that we become very impractical people in our life here. Many, many years ago when I was a little boy, I knew a person. I've seen this person alive, an old man who was a medical doctor, lived till 90, 95 years old. His children were all in school. When, uh, and, and this man who was an Anglican Christian. All of a sudden became spiritual, became very spiritual, started really getting into the Lord's things and so on. Got excited about it. And then he went so far out into that. So somebody told him, Jesus is going to come soon, brother. And this man took it so, so uh, as an urgent message. So he went home, he told all of his kids, don't go to school. It's a waste of time. Jesus is going to come. Why are you going to school for? Why write these exams? Why study? Why work yourself up to a profession? Why plan on staying here? Why plan for the future? Now imagine, he's a medical doctor, a very famous medical doctor in that area where he lived. He was doctor for some of the leading people there. Very educated, bright man, intellectual man. Somehow, spiritually, he flipped. He stopped all the children from going to school. Finally, he had to support all the children. Thank God he had some money. So he could do it. <laughs> what will other people do when they don't have anything? Told them all to stop. No one had any education. You know, they stayed at home thinking that Jesus is going to come any minute. And what you're trying, what, everything that you're trying to do here in this world is waste of time. People become so heavenly minded, they become so no earthly good. There is this other kind of people also we see in our country and I'm sure here also that have this philosophy that in this world I want to have nothing. I want to have nothing. They have this philosophy that I brought nothing, I take back nothing, so I try to get nothing also here. <laughs> that's a very bad philosophy, right? I came naked, that's their golden verse. Naked did I come from my mother's womb, naked will I return. Well, I think that one verse you have to interpret it literally. In our country, when a new child is born, when a baby is born in a home, we go to see that baby, we always carry a set of clothing. Most people, 99% of the people will buy a new set of clothing for the child and go because they know very well that the child may have great potential. Tomorrow he may become a doctor, lawyer, preacher, president, prime minister, whatever, you know. He's got all that potential in seed form in, inside the child. But right now, the only thing he does not have is clothing. A child born is born with a naked did he come. So we go and give clothing. But some people have taken it as a message to them thinking that we came with nothing, what are we going to take? So, not make any money also. Not make a useful uh, life in this world, you know. Not, not be employed and not go earn money and not plan for the future, not build a house, not gather or accumulate any kind of wealth and so on. They have this kind of philosophy that lands them in the wrong side of things, you know. That later on they suffer. They don't want to build houses because in, in our country, for example, some of them are very, some Christians are very proud that in, their, in this earth they have nothing. One of the qualifications of a true Christian is that in this world you have nothing. You know. Amazing how they reach that conclusion. And Jeremiah's prophecy is exactly the opposite. He says, build houses. 
Why build houses? Because you're going to be here for some time. <laughs> Whatever the length of time. Tomorrow Jesus may come, but if he delays for another 100 years, you're going to be here. Even if he delays for another 10, 20 years, you need a house. Why do you want to rent? Build. <laughs> That's the wisest thing to do. It's the proper use of your resources. Build the houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat their fruit. <laughs> Take wives for your sons, husbands for your daughters. Get them fixed up. That's what we do in our country. At least we think we do. A lot of our kids now find themselves uh, their own partners in life. But that's all right. Get them married, in other words. In other words, live as if you're going to be here for some time. In this case, these people were going to be there for some time. At least 70 years, they're going to be here until God takes them back. So do the normal activities. Build a house, plant the gardens, and get the children married. Don't diminish, increase. There is power in number. <laughs> That's the message of God. And then the fourth thing, seek the peace of the city where I've caused you to be carried away captive. Oh, this is the hardest thing. <laughs> this has to be the toughest thing. To pray for your enemies. To pray for your enemies. The Old Testament in the Old Testament, the Bible scholars say about this verse, about praying for your city, you know, and praying for the peace of that city. For in its peace, you will have peace. And one translation says, in its prosperity, you will have prosperity. Pray for the prosperity of the city in which you live. You live in a city, I live in a city, I live in the fourth largest city in India. Sometimes, you know what happens to Christians? They dislike this world so much. <laughs> I understand what the Bible says about the world, you know. We should not be worldly people. We should not be attached to this world and the ways of the world. That's, that's the way the Bible talks about the world when it talks about it negatively. The Bible is not teaching about hating this world. It is hating about the world's way of life world's philosophy. Otherwise, why would John 3.16 say, for God so loved the world? Which world does he love? <laughs> if you're going to hate the world in which you live, which world does God love? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but must, must, must have everlasting life. That verse says a lot. It says, God loves this world. This world that is filled with such evil, corruption, such sin. God loves this world so much that he wants to redeem this world. He wants to bring this world back to the shape that he ever wanted it to be. Not only redeem this world, he wants to redeem the people that live in this world. Therefore, he sent his son to give his life on the cross of Calvary. So the people and the world itself can be redeemed. God so loved the world that he would send his son to die on a cross to redeem its people and the world. So you got to be careful about hating the world. You know. Be sure which world you're hating. You're not hating the world which God loves. I'm doing ministry in the country where I'm doing ministry because I know God loves this world. I know God loves its people. And you and I should live where we live and be a part of the world in which we are uh, there and thrive in this world and flourish in this world and be established in this world knowing that God loves this world. And God is in the business of redeeming this world. God wants to reach out to this world. And one of the ways that God reaches not only by sending his son but 
getting us saved and having us reach out also. That is why God has got us here. So don't hate the world in the wrong way. Hate the ways of the world, the sins of the world, the lusts of the world, and the things of the flesh and so on. But not just hate the world itself. It's a world that was made by God. God never made anything evil. If God made it, it's good. It's man who corrupted it. So this must have been the hardest thing for the people of God to do. To pray for the peace of the city where God says he has carried them into. To pray for Babylon is a thing that their ears would never like to hear. To pray for Babylon. And Bible scholars say this is the only place in the Old Testament where it talks about praying for your enemies. In the New Testament, it's a big subject. In the New Testament, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, pray for those who persecute you. Rejoice and be glad when they persecute you. And pray for them. It's a big teaching and Paul talks about it in Romans and in, in just about every episode of his. He talks about how to deal with our enemies, how to pray for them reach out to them and so on. It's a big subject in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, it's different. You know in the Old Testament how they thought about the enemies? Turn with me to Psalm 137. Psalm 137. Psalm 137 is about people sitting outside the city of Babylon. This very same situation. And it's about a song that they wrote while they were there. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. Now, this song was sung by a, an African group. I uh, forget the name of it. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat. It's a famous song. And one fellow came to me and said, you know, that's a Bible song? Yeah, that's a backslider song. <laughs> by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat. These are people, rebellious people having lost their land, lost their relationship with God, you know, sitting by the rivers of Babylon, they remembered Zion. How? We hung our harps upon the willows in the midst of it. For there, those who carried us away captive asked us for a song, and those who plundered us requested mirth, saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. The people of Israel were known for their songs, their singing and dancing and their joy. Their joyful songs and music. They were known for it. So those people said in Babylon, hey, sing us one of your songs. Come on. Let's hear one of your songs. They said, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem. See how their heart is longing for Jerusalem. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget its skill. If I do not remember you, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. If I do not exit, uh, exalt Jerusalem above my chief joy. So there they're sitting there remembering Jerusalem. Their heart is aching. Their tongue is clinging to the roof of their mouth. And look at what they say next. Remember, O Lord, against the sons of Edom, the day of Jerusalem, who said, raise it, raise it to its very foundation. They're saying, now they're praying. They said, O Lord, Remember how these people, these Babylonians that are asking them to sing now, these Babylonians said, raise it, demolish Jerusalem, plunder it, vandalize it, finish with it, your holy city. Remember, O oh Lord, what they said. Now see how they're praying. O oh, daughter of Babylon, who are to be destroyed. Look at their prayer. Not a very Christian prayer. <laughs> Happy the one who repays you as you have served us. Happy the one who takes and dashes your little ones against the rock. <laughs> Look at God's people praying. They're saying, happy is the one who rep repays you as you have served us. May what you have done for us happen to you, they're saying. Then they're saying, Happy the one who takes and dashes your little ones against the rock. I mean, you can't pray a harder prayer. 
more rude prayer than this one. Cruel prayer than this one. You've never heard. And that's the kind of feeling that they had. Just imagine the feeling of the people. They hated the situation in which they are. They hated the people that they have done this, that have done this to them. Wanted to get back at them. Wanted God to send fire from heaven. Somebody do something to these people. That's the way they were thinking about it. Let's turn to Psalm 122. Psalm 122. Look how they pray for Jerusalem. Now this is how Psalm 137 is the way they prayed. But prayed for Babylon in that situation. But Psalm 122 talks about how they prayed for Jerusalem. Look at verse 6. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls. Prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brethren and companions. I will now say, peace be within you. Because of the house of the Lord our God. I will seek your good. Look at how beautifully they are praying for Jerusalem. And look at the difference between Psalm 137 and Psalm 122. 137 they are saying, let somebody take your little ones and dash them against the rocks. We'll be happy if they did it. Here they are saying about Jerusalem. They are saying, may they, may they prosper who love you. <laughs> Those who do good to you, may they prosper. Peace be within your walls. Prosperity within your palaces. They are praying this kind of prayer. In other words, what God was saying when in, in Jeremiah 29, in verse 7, when he said to them, seek the peace of the city where, you, where I have caused you to be carried away and pray, for the, pray the Lord for it. For in its peace you will have peace. You know what God is saying? What prophet, the prophet Jeremiah was saying? He was saying, how you will pray for Jerusalem you pray for Babylon. Remember the way you used to pray for Jerusalem, for the peace of Jerusalem, saying those who do good to you be blessed. Pray like that now for your enemies, even though they have done wrong to you, pray that God will bless them. It's a very difficult thing. I'm sure they hated Jeremiah for that. And I can show you, they really hated Jeremiah for it. Because there's a one man here named Shemaiah, who wrote a letter back to the priest in Jerusalem after getting this letter from Jeremiah, after they read the letter to the audience there in, outside of Babylon. This man was so annoyed by this letter, he wrote a letter back to the priest in Jerusalem condemning this. Look at verse 24. Jeremiah hears about that letter that was written condemning him. And Jeremiah now speaks about that. He says, you shall also speak to Shemaiah the Nehalamite, saying, thus speaks the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, you have sent letters in your name to all the people who are at Jerusalem, to Zephaniah the son of Messiah, the priest, and to all the priests, saying, the Lord has made you priests instead of Jehodiah the priest, so that there should be officers in the house of the Lord over every man who is demented. In other words, he's saying to the priest, hey, God has placed you as priest in the place of another guy that was there. Why? So that there shall be officers in the house of the Lord over every man who's demented, every man who's crazy. He's talking about Jeremiah. And considers himself a prophet. So that there will be officers in the house of the Lord over every man who's demented and considers himself a prophet that you should put him in prison and in the stocks. In other words, he's saying, somebody take this crazy prophet, this prophet who's written to us, saying, stay there, build houses, live in them, plant gardens, and eat their fruit, get your sons and daughters married, so that you'll increase, and pray for the city of Jerusalem. Abomination! Somebody catch this crazy guy, lock him up, tie him up, put him in chains. And lock him up. Now therefore, why have you not rebuked Jeremiah, Anathoth, 
of Anathoth who makes himself a prophet to you for he has sent us in Babylon saying this captivity is long build houses and, and dwell in Jerusalem plant gardens and eat from uh, their fruit <laughs> and that priest read it to Jeremiah the prophet just imagine this letter going back and Jeremiah replies that the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah saying, verse 30, send to all those in captivity saying, thus says the Lord concerning Shemaiah the Nehelamite, because Shemaiah has prophesied to you and I have not sent him. He has caused you to trust in a lie. Therefore, thus says the Lord, behold, I will punish Shemaiah the Nehelamite and his family. He shall not have anyone to dwell among the people among this people that means he will not have posterity nor shall he see the good that I will do for my people says the Lord because he has taught rebellion against the Lord now Jeremiah's prophecy saying stay there build houses eat the fruit of the garden that you plant and get your daughters married and pray for the city of Jerusalem is a prophecy that was hated by some people this man represents those people hate was so much that he wrote this letter what God was saying was hey you've been placed in the place where you are by God's will whatever the circumstances may be that got you there God has got an agenda God has got a plan God has got a plan in me being born in India and raised in India God has got a plan in you being born here and raised here being in this city, in this situation. And sometimes you and I may not like the situation we are in. We may not like the way things are going. We may not like, uh, you know, how our life is going. It's not going according to plan, particularly through this corona problem, you know. It upset all of us, you know. Some people have started questioning God. You know, Why did God allow this? Why? 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 You know, even good people started having questions. Why all these things happen? Has God forsaken us? Has God abandoned us? Why does God have us here? This is such an evil world, such a corrupt world. Why has God got us here? We don't like anything that is going on sometimes in our surrounding. And I tell you, I think the word of the Lord comes to all of us today, just like it came to the people of Judea living in Babylon at that time. The word of the Lord is saying, Build houses, plant gardens, eat the fruit, get your sons and daughters married. Plan on staying here for some time because I got job for you to do. And pray for the city in which you live. Pray for its peace, its prosperity. Because when it has prosperity, you will have prosperity. What will you do with your prosperity? You'll be a blessing. Now just imagine what happened after hearing these words. There were a group of young people that believed in this prophecy. Build houses prophecy. Plant gardens prophecy. Get married prophecy. So they went into Babylon. They were Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And people like that. Very gifted, educated, skilled young people. They got into the city. They reported to the king. They said, yeah, we are here. We can do some work. We know this, we know that, you know, we are, we are skilled in these areas. We, are, we have expertise in these areas. We offer you to, offer to help you. We're going to use our best abilities for the blessing and the peace of this land. This Babylon that has done such evil to us. That is so corrupt, that has no justice in there. We're going to do our best to be a blessing to this city, they said. Just see how God used them. They thought it was the greatest curse to be there in Babylon. They thought these cursed Gentiles, these Babylonians are good only for firewood in hell. That God would never bless a Gentile. You know, I was reading a Jewish book about Jewish, sketches of Jewish life. It's called long time ago. Amazing how they thought some of the Jews started thinking that that they were made for heaven. And all the Gentiles 
were made for firewood in hell. They started thinking like that, that they are God's people. God loves them and only salvation is only for them. That's why, you know, you hear the story of, uh, of uh, the, the Samaritan woman. You know, it is said, salvation is of the Jews. You know, salvation is only for the Jews, they thought. Not for the Gentiles. And here they are told to pray for the Gentiles. How many of you believe our God is an evangelistic God? <laughs> our God is a God of world missions. You know, God didn't start the world with Abraham. Hello? <laughs> God started the world with Adam. So when it comes to redemption, God doesn't want to just redeem Abraham and his children. Salvation is not just for the Jewish people. Salvation is for people. People of every tongue, every tribe, every culture. That is what the book of Revelation says. That in heaven one day, we're going to see people of every tongue, tribe, and nation, every kind of people represented. They'll all be praising God. God is an evangelistic God. God is a God who sends forth his people everywhere to the ends of this earth to preach the gospel to every tribe and every tongue and every nation. God sends people. God has sent you here. God has sent me where I am. God has sent each and every one of us with this purpose. He wants the gospel to go forth. He wants to manifest his glory to the people that have never seen the one and true living God. Everybody worships something. Wherever there are people, you'll find them having some kind of worship way. And everybody searches for God. Paul walks into Athens, he finds temples everywhere. Every corner there's temple. In our country, it's like that. We are the most religious people you know, in the world, I think. People love religion. People love to, you know, would, would love to find out about God. People seek after God. You stand there and talk some philosophy about God, a crowd will gather. Indian people are the most religious people of all people, I think. But all people are religious. Everybody is religious. Everybody seeks after God. Paul goes to Athens and he finds all kinds of temples and then one finds one temple that says to the unknown God. And he begins to preaching, preaching, saying, I've come to preach to you about this unknown God. How interesting it must have been to them. They must have all stood there and heard, ah, oh, because they built temples to every god that they knew. And then they thought, maybe we missed out something, someone. We don't want that god to be angry. So they built one temple and they said, to the unknown god, so that they don't miss anyone. And Paul said, that's the god I'm preaching about. That's the god who revealed himself through Jesus Christ. Everybody's searching for god. People are looking for god. Wherever there are people, there will be worship of some kind. Something they will be worshipping. And God wants to reveal himself. His own and only true living God wants to reveal himself to people who are searching, who are looking, who want to know God. God wants to reveal his glory. That's why he sent these people there. That is why when the king said, if you don't fall down and worship the statue that I have made, I'm going to throw you in the burning furnace. God showed up. God showed up where? Right in the middle of the burning furnace. He got into the burning furnace. So that the king later on said, what kind of a God is this God who saves it like this? Like what? He's a God who gets into the fire. Comes where you are. If you are in the fire, he comes where you are in the midst of the fire. He reveals his glory in all kinds of situations. He revealed himself in a mighty way so that everyone proclaimed that your God is the God. What a wonderful event that must have been. Thank God they obeyed. Thank God Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Han never built houses. 
Some people think building house itself is a sin. You know, you're a worldly person. They were being a mighty testimony to God's glory and power. Daniel in lion's den. Daniel was sleeping well. The king was not able to sleep. In his palace, in his nicest bed, he is not able to sleep. Daniel is sleeping well. Lion's mouths were shut. Because angels of God and shut, come and shut their mouths. What a great God he is. He gets in the midst of the fire. He gets in the midst of the lion's den. He reveals his glory. He comes to a strange land where they think there's no presence of God. They said, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? I bet you after all these things happened, they started singing the Lord's song in a strange land. I loved your singing. We need to sing the songs. The joy of the Lord must be made known. The life in Christ must be made manifested. So basically, Jeremiah was saying, pray for the city in which you live. Pray for its peace because in its peace and prosperity, you will have peace and prosperity. In Psalm 122, which we just looked at, if you look at it, he says, pray for several things quickly. I will just mention that and I will close. 122, Psalm 122. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That means the prosperity. Peace is the word shalom. Literally means prosperity. That means well-being in every area of your life. Prosperity is not just a money word, you know. It's a word that has to do with your spirit, soul, and, pro and body, and every area of your life. Well-being in every area. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. That means pray for the prosperity. May peace be within your walls. Secondly, pray for the safety. Pray for the safety, the violence to diminish, the criminals to be saved, the corrupt people to be reformed and changed. May peace be within your walls. Prosperity within your palaces. Palaces is about politics. Pray for your politics. Some, of the, some, some people don't like the way things have turned out politically. <laughs> God says pray for your palaces, for the peace of your palaces, or the prosperity within your palaces. Pray for the politics of your city, your country. For the sake of my brethren and companions, I now say peace be within you. Pray for the people people of the city. Pray for the people of your country. So pray for the prosperity of the country, the city that in which you live. Pray for the safety of the place where you live, where God has placed you. And pray for the politics of the place in which you live. And pray also for the people of that place in which God has placed you. If you're wondering, if in case you're wondering why you're here, that being here is a waste of time, I tell you it's not a waste of time. You are here because of God's purpose. I am there because of God's purpose. We are here to represent God. We are here to be a manifestation of God's glory in some small way or sometimes in a very great way, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, like Daniel. God may do amazing things through you and I, reveal himself to this world, in a world that needs God. Babylon needed God. And God revealed himself. And God wants to reveal himself. Now we're going to get ready, to, we're getting ready to build a church. You know, same problem you face when you, when you, when you, when you get ready to build a church. From the Christians sometimes, the believers, the so-called believers. They say, well, Jesus is going to come soon, brother. Why do you want to build a, such a big church? <laughs> It's because he's going to come. That's why I want to build a big church. It's because he's going to come. That is why I'm working here. It is because he's going to come. That is why I'm preaching the gospel. My preaching the gospel, staying here, doesn't cancel his coming. But until he comes, I'm going to do my job. And you ought to do. You ought to grow. You got to 
grow out of these walls and and build bigger and bigger and be established and be very strong in this place why for god's glory to be revealed we are not building houses so that we can just sleep in them we are building houses so that we can do something for god stay here and do something for god as long as god is god is here we are not building churches so we can say we built a beautiful church no we are building churches to house people to bring people in to preach the word of god so that people can be taught and 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 be guided and so that they'll become vessels through which god's glory is revealed everywhere to the thousands of places where they come from the glory of god will go amen i say to you my friend 2022 23 is coming 20 days is going to be over what is 2023 going to be if jesus doesn't come by then build houses plant gardens and eat their fruit build houses and live in them get your sons and daughters married and pray for the prosperity of the city where god has placed you and shine for jesus may the glory of god be seen throughout this place may god be revealed to each and every one may people come to god in great numbers by the thousands and thousands that is why you and i here are here don't resent the situation don't resent the present situation don't begin to question god where is god has he left us you know no 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 god is right there god is right there in the midst of it all and god has got an agenda and you and i are believing christians so we do not murmur we do not complain we do not doubt we believe <coughs> that god has got us here Amen. and we move forward with great faith you pray for us that god will help us to get accomplish what we have set out there to do by god's guidance and we will be praying for you in the days to come that you will also grow and multiply and increase in an unprecedented manner and be a great blessing to this place that you're in god bless you let's all stand up together please praise the lord Come on, let's just lift up our hands. Father, you have blessed us. We thank you, God, for, for your word. Thank you for your message today. And we thank you for that in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We give you praise. We give you praise. We give you praise. So let's just do that right now. Let's just pray for the peace. Let's pray for the peace of America. Amen. Can we do that right now? Father, we just lift our hands up to you right now. We pray for the peace of our nation. Lord, we pray for the prosperity of our nation. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we pray for unity in our nation. God, that you would, Lord God, we thank you. We've been standing and believing. We believe it is true, God, that you're sending revival to our nation. Lord God, that people are going to come to you, Lord, from the north, the south, east, and west. Lord, that you're raising up houses, Lord, of, of, of your glory to manifest your presence, Lord. We thank you. We give you praise. We give you honor. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for that so much, oh God. We give you glory. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. I appreciate, Pastor, I appreciate this message. You know, the Lord, the Lord deals with my heart very clearly that within the, the division, but political division that's in our nation, that he doesn't want me to be a part of that division. He wants to be part of the solution. He wants sort of me to be not only a citizen of America, but he wants sort of me to be an ambassador of the kingdom of heaven, representing him, his plan, his purpose. Hallelujah. Sometimes people are so partisan in their view, they don't pray for the nation if the wrong party is in power. 
We're afraid. We're afraid. But you know, it, you know what that meant. I was I was listening, and I think you know. So so for me, being a Christian, a believer, for you being a believer, it don't matter who's in charge. Amen. So we can go ahead and just pray for our nation, pray for whatever government that's in power. Believe that as we pray for them, that God would cause His peace, His prosperity to be fulfilled in our life. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. We give you praise. We give you glory. Hallelujah. 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 Just, just lay your hand on your heart. Let's just pray right now. Father, just pray for every person here today. We thank you, Lord, for this Thanksgiving season. Thank you, God, for our time with family. And, and we thank you, Lord, that you have so richly blessed us. Lord, we confess to you, Lord God, that we are a blessed people and that you have blessed us so much. We thank you for that today in every way. We give you praise. Thank you for your abundance. Thank you for your abundance, Lord. We give you glory. We give you praise. Let's bring the praise team out here. Let's sing that, that last song we were singing. I think Michelle was leading that song about God's faithfulness, goodness. Let's just sing that before. We're going we're gonna to receive an offering in just a few moments for our special speakers, so don't leave, leave yet. Let's sing this song and, and just lift our hands up and to declare the faithfulness of God. Will you do that with us together? I love you, Lord. For your mercy never fails me. Lord. have this sense in my spirit it came to me even in the first worship we 
worshiping before. There's, if you're here today and you've been having stomach problems, is that anybody here right now? There's a couple of hands. You guys just come up here and just keep having that sense. If you're having stomach problems, hallelujah. of the Holy Spirit you know I just kept that stirring I, I pushed it off we come back up here and sing it again it came back to me again so Lord we just want to thank you right now Lord as, as we just respond in faith to, to the direction of the Holy Spirit hallelujah hallelujah Pastor Sam you want to come help me pray for these people I'm, we're just going to lay hands on them in the name of Jesus hallelujah Come on, everybody here, lift your hands up together. We're just praying together in faith for our brothers and sisters. The power of the Holy Spirit is just going to touch them. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for the power of God that touches my sister right now. <laughs> in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Father, by the power of the Holy Ghost, behold, in the name of Jesus. Yes, Father, grab myself. In the name of Jesus, behold, loose her. Father, today we just thank you for your healing touch upon every person that we've laid hands on and even those in the crowd today, Lord. Father, thank you for your peace, your peace, your shalom, Lord, that touches them, Lord. Lord, every fiber of their body, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, thank you, Lord. We give you praise. 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 Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 There's a person here, you've been, you've been greatly worried, troubled about something that seems to be looming in your future. Hallelujah. But I just feel like this message preached to you was for you today. Among all of us, but I'm telling you for you today. The Lord knows the thoughts that he has for you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Hallelujah. 
In the middle of your darkness, there's going to be a, there's going to be a light arise. There's going to be an open door. There's going to be a, an opportunity. The favor of God is going to manifest. The glory of God is going to show up right in the middle of your darkness, right in the middle of your trial, right in the middle of your fire, right in the middle of your lion's den experience. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I just hear the Lord say, don't hang your harp on a willow tree. Come on, keep singing the song of the Lord. Even if it feels like a strange time or a strange season, don't hang up your harp. Just sing the song of the Lord. Hallelujah, the song of His goodness. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Man, I'm about to shout up in here. Amen. Hallelujah. 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 <laughs> Amen. Oh, glory. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Some of you need to get your harp out. Shine it up. Tune it up. Come on now. We're going to sing this Lord's song. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And we believe the best is yet to come. Amen. Wow. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Amen. Our ushers are going to come and we're going to receive a love offering for our speaker today. Just give you an opportunity of, to bless the man of God. We're just greatly honored and blessed to have Pastor Cheldurai along with his wife in the service. Thank God for how the Lord has used him, blessed him in India, not only in India, but throughout the world. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you blessed us so much. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We're thankful for the opportunity of giving and sharing. We give you praise. Hallelujah. I know you sat down so you can access your billfold, but having access to you stand back up. Amen. We're going to give. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Father, thank you for this offering today. Thank you for, Lord, that you meet every need according to your riches and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. While you're giving, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask Will to come up here. Praise the Lord. Amen. We heard, we heard some good news, so we just want you to tell everybody. Uh, so as, as many of you guys know, uh, I'm 20, so after high school for two years, I moved to California. I felt the Lord call me to do ministry school. And honestly, it was one of the best experiences of my life. I got to know the Lord more there. I learned how to minister, how to talk to God, made some amazing friends. <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, maybe last December, I saw the success my older brother was having in baseball. And I was like, I don't know what, really what I'm going to do next. I'm 6'8", I'm left-handed. I feel like I should probably use my height for something. So, so for the last year, I've been in... And out in California, I've just been, I've been practicing, I've been working. And um, I'm at a junior college this year. And actually, like, two weeks ago, I just signed my letter of, it, letter of intent to play at Wake Forest. So, it's all. <laughs> and it's so crazy, it's so God, because literally everyone on my team has been playing, like, their whole lives. And I came in, I took two years off. I'm like a Bible school kid. And I was like the first guy on my team to like sign anywhere. And this is like one of the best schools in the country. And like, I wasn't even, I wasn't even smart in high school and I'm going to Wake Forest, it's crazy. And 
I just wanted to, I just wanted to encourage all you, all of y'all. It's not just sports. Like the Lord, He wants to move in like y'all's work, in y'all's endeavors, in your businesses, in in stuff that y'all like. So it's not just sports. Like me and Paul have these awesome, these awesome stories, obviously. But yeah, He wants to move through it all. So bless you guys. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Wonderful. Paul, come up here. We haven't had, yeah. I don't think you've testified since, since what happened in your life. I'll let you tell it. But you know, we just want to always praise God for how God has blessed the young people in our church. You know, one of the prayers we pray on a continual basis is that God makes them champions. Amen. Athletics, academics, but most all for Christ. Well, yeah, uh, yeah this is crazy. But um, out of high school, I wasn't like a crazy great athlete. I went to a Division three school because that was the only offer I had, and it's crazy how God works. I was there for a year, didn't see a lot of success, and uh, it was really expensive. It was tough financially, and my dad was like, hey, like, this is cheap, like, and I'm not going to watch you sit on the bench pretty much, so he's like, you need to work harder. You need to get better. It's like, yeah, you know, that's, that's fair, so uh, I spent that whole summer working out trying to get better and work harder and I ended up going back to that school again for the fall and just didn't feel like the right place for me so I transferred to a local junior college and didn't have a lot of success couldn't throw strikes get nervous on the mound uh, and then COVID happened a lot COVID didn't help a lot of people but it, for me it saved my baseball career because they gave us another year of eligibility at junior college I went to a different school where everything just clicked. I got better and everything came together at once. I was throwing really hard. And uh, an LSU called me. It was like a dream come true. It was a school I always wanted to go to. And I got to go play baseball at one of the greatest programs in the country. Had a lot of success. And then this year, this summer, we were praying that what was right for me if I was going to go back to LSU or hopefully pursue professional baseball. And uh, the first day didn't go the way we thought it would. I didn't get didn't get picked, and I was confused. I was worried. I was didn't understand. And then the next day, uh, I got a phone call and from the New York Mets, and they told me they wanted me to be a part of their organization, and all their dreams came true. <laughs> God is good. God is good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Amen. Bless you. Hallelujah. Come on, let's stand up and shout. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So proud of these young men. I've known them since they were, I think, I think, uh, Isaac met Paul when they were in kindergarten, I think, something like that. Amen. But I'm just thankful for what God has done in their life and the success He's given them. But in the success, they're, 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 they're a light for Christ. And we're very thankful for that. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Shake hands and fellowship as you are dismissed. Praise the Lord.